thank you. Uh, I'm excited. I'm gonna gonna jump into uh, the presentation uh, right away, but I want to say uh, thanks to everyone uh, who's not only um, taking part in these clinics because I think they're pretty special. But hold on, let me. Um, so who's not only participating, but all of the speakers. Really cool to uh, to be able to to uh, learn from everybody. I mean, it's, it's just been awesome that we're sharing. I'm going to credit, obviously, you know, Golden Tickets, but uh, but Chris Oliver, who's been a, a, a mentor, a friend of mine, um, I think a leader in this country as far as, um, you know, sharing ideas and, and, and doing it at such a high level. Chris is um, one of my favorite people in basketball. And, and from the beginning uh, of my coaching career, he's always been someone that supported me. So I'm, I'm grateful for this opportunity. Um, to, to, to be on this platform. Uh, before we start, I just want to say a couple things. One, uh, Kelly Dunham on, the, on, the, on my right uh, passed away a few days ago, uh, was a fantastic person in the basketball community. Um, you know, knew her when I was at McMaster as a player and, uh, and just, you know, full of energy. Our, our, our coach Malala is, is one of those people who's like her. He just so much energy and, and passion for your, uh, for your sport and for people. Um, so I just wanted to sort of acknowledge her because she's done a lot for the game and a lot for people in and around the game um, as an educator and as a leader. Um, the one on my left, Sandy Pottier, um, gave me my start in basketball. So, you know, I wouldn't be sitting here if not for her, uh, who has also passed away of cancer years ago. But she was, um, she gave me my start. She was the first, it was the first sort of post-secondary opportunity I ever got. So I'm always grateful for her. Um, and everything that she has done for me in my career, but for all the, the women she coached uh, at Rice, and, and, and without a doubt, one of the fiercest competitors um, in the coaching world I ever worked with. So um, just a, a, a little thought of them, because there's no question they, they have a huge part in what we're doing here today, all of us. Um, and then on that note, on a happy note, I want to congratulate Michelle Belanger, 41 years at U of T really big time. Um, Michelle is someone I've talked to over the years about basketball on a number of different occasions. Um, and she's just such a bright, bright mind, brilliant mind. Um, the one thing that I'm always impressed with is her passion 41 years later. You know, I didn't know her 41 years ago. I wasn't even born, not to age her, but, but, to, um, but I know that, you know, having coached against her and having watched her, she just, she kept going. She, that fire is like still burning. So um, congratulations to you, Michelle, if you're listening. Um, and, uh, you know, best of luck on, on what comes next. Uh, let's get into disruptive uh, defense. So what I'm going to talk about is not necessarily um, system-based, okay? So not, as I say here, it's not necessarily, you know, you're a zone team or as AJ Sharma's presentation on pack line. It's, it's not uh, a system-based idea. It's more of a... Um, you know, thinking about things in terms of add-ons on a menu to help enhance your defense, right, in your team's play. Um, and I just put this up, you know, you, you order a smoothie, you order a strawberry banana smoothie, uh, but there's always these things you can add in, you know, do you feel like protein powder today or wheatgrass and you mix it up and you, you sort of, um, you know, you add on to what you're already doing. So again, not so much system-based, but add-ons, things that, you know, um, that teams do, uh, that everyone I think can do uh, to help enhance their defense in different ways. And as we were talking earlier, you know, this clinic's great because you can, it, it's, this is kind of a, the same concept. It's a menu of, of ideas and things that you can take from different people and um, add, subtract, you know, and recreate in your own uh, coaching. So that's sort of to frame what we're, what we're talking about. So as part of that, it's like, you know, you have to ask yourself a few questions, I think, and, um, and, and what do you believe? You know, what's your sort of your philosophy defensively? Um, you know, uh, how do you want to play? I think are important questions. Um, who is your personnel? I think that's a big one. You know, you can, you can be whoever you want, but if you don't have the horses, it's, sometimes that's tough. Um, and what do you credit to wins and losses? You know, I think sometimes we, we, we split ourselves to sort of offensive people or defensive people. Um, and so I think one thing to, you know, that's important to sort of acknowledge um, is that you're not going to outscore everyone every time. I think that's the obvious one. Um, 
you know, and for me, in my opinion, you know, your defense needs to be able to, I would say, buy you time when your offensive quality is subpar. And I say that sort of jokingly, but the reality is you're not going to outscore everyone. You're not going to score 150 points every game. Um, and you need to rely on your defense. It puts less stress on your offense and vice versa, but just sort of focusing on the defensive end for sure. Um, we, I think we can all agree that that's true. So philosophy is from some of the best. Like, you know, obviously, you know, everyone knows Nick Nurse. Um, you know, if you don't know, Toronto Raptors won the championship last year. And, and one of the things that Coach Nurse always says is that your level of NBA defense comes down to your level of shot contest. Um, and, you know, in the game now where shot quality is so important, I think, you know, you heard that from Jay Triano. You heard that from Phil kind of basketball the other day. Shot quality is, is important um, from an offensive perspective. You want to get good shots. So from the defensive end, you know, the question of how can you lower the quality of the other team that the other team gets, the quality of the shot that the other team gets as often as possible becomes, you know, sort of paramount. This yin and yang in this basketball, um, you know, is like, is constant, right? You're trying, to, you're trying to do one thing, you're trying to push, they're trying to pull. And so, you know, how do you lower the shot quality um, as often as possible. And so I'm going to give you a couple of different generic things here. And one of them is shot, um, shot contest. It's a big one that I, I would say, and I would suggest should be in everyone's defense. Here's another one, um, you know, from Mike Moonhoser, um, you know, talking about transition defense is where your defense starts. You know, if you're not good in transition, you probably aren't, you know, you're not going to be too good is his thought. And you'll be taking the ball out of the net um, quite a bit, and you'll end up playing a lot of offense. I'm paraphrasing, but I think the idea is, you know, you got to get stops, right? You got to get stops. You don't want to always be in the half court. And I'll, I'll speak to something uh, that sort of goes with that in a minute, but you don't want to be in the half court. And, and obviously, you know, for those that watch uh, the NBA, the Bucks are a big time paint protect, protection team. And lastly, looking at uh, Doc Rivers, for example. So, you know, he's looking for activity in his players and go through the quote you guys can all read. But um, the idea is that, you know, he's he based more on effort and defense and not, you know, making and missing shots in terms of how he manages his team and, and taking people in and out of games. So the point there is, you know, three pretty good coaches, we could all agree, and they make defense a priority. It's a part of what they do, um, you know, and, and Doc Rivers' teams, I could say Coach Rivers' teams, as I've always watched them and He's one of the first people I sort of looked at defensively. I've always been good at guarding the ball one-on-one. -on -one. You know, really do a good job uh, taking care of uh, the ball that's in front of them. So it leads me to the question of, you know, offense or defense. What are you about, you know? Uh, and does it even have to be one or the other? But let's have a look at, you know, in the NBA this past season, or to the point they were at, um, on the offensive side, the offensive rating on the left, uh, the Mavericks, the Rockets, the Clippers, the Lakers, and the Celtics round out the top five. And you can see the offensive ratings there, at, you know, at 115 down to 112. Um, and then on the defensive side, you got the Bucks, the Raptors, the Lakers, the Celtics, the Clippers, and obviously some overlap. Um, but you don't see the Raptors on the other side. You know, I don't, you see the Bucks somewhere in the sixth spot. Um, and so I, I always ask the question, I know it's come out a lot in, in this, the last couple of months, it's like, what side of the ball are you on? Um, and my answer to that is both. <laughs> both matter for winning. You know, it's hard to be one or the other. Um, and both matter for winning. And, and in the NBA and, and in really at every level, for the most part, winning matters. And that's what it's about. And ultimately, whether we like it or not, that's part of what coaches are judged on. And that's how it works. So you got to figure out how you're doing both. And when you look at the top five, uh, net ratings, you see the Bucks, the Lakers, you know, the Clippers, the Raptors, the Celtics, and how that translates pretty quickly, you know, to wins on the other end of it. You see the same five teams who have figured out how to do both pretty successfully. So I, I start with that because I think it's important that as much as we're talking about defense, um, that you got to do both. It's not just one or the other. You got to figure out how you're going to do both. Um, and so let's jump into some some factors and some things you can do regardless of what um, you know, system or what you believe in defensively that you can do to enhance your defense. Um, so there's a reality, right? That, that tons of NBA players, LeBron, Harden, you know, on most nights, you're not going to stop them, but you don't necessarily need to. My thought is, you know, 
can you steal possessions? Can you disrupt, you know, the rhythm of their offense, the individuals and their team, right? And the, and the question I ask um, that's sort of the basis for a lot of this is how can you start to influence the offense's options to make their actions more predictable? Okay, and I read that again. How can you start to influence um, the offense's options to make their actions more predictable? Um, and so what does that mean? What does that look like? Well, you know, if you get to the end of a clock, there's pretty much, we can all think of, take, you know, four seconds and think about what are you going to see at the end of a shot clock, right? Typically, you're seeing mid-ball screens and isolation plays, right? So now we're starting to narrow down some of those factors. And can you get, can you get people to those places often so that you're having to guard less? You're having to guard less back screens, less cross screens, less action overall right? And how we do that. And so we know that, you know, in, in taking from some of the uh, other presentations that the PPP for, you know, a ball handler, for example, um, shooting the ball is a lot lower. If they take the shot, it's a lot lower than it is if they make a play. Well, with five or six seconds left, um, not a lot of passes are being made typically, and you're in a better position to, to get some stops. Uh, any questions so far? Does that make sense where we're going? Uh, only question right now, Coach, is just someone asked on the other slide there, your offensive rating and defensive ratings, kind of how those were calculated or what those were looking at. Yeah, so you've, you, it, it encompasses – it's funny because I, I thought, maybe, maybe I'll put a definition in there. Um, it encompasses a bunch of different factors. You can go on the NBA site and sort of see all the particular factors on offense and defense. Um, but it's not just – I mean, the, the NBA and a lot of these calculations, they're not just – how much how many points you actually score necessarily it's points per 100 possession this is essentially how it works um but you can get online and and, and definitely see that okay that works thank you um so three themes this is what we're going to cover when it covered uh three themes and i'm just going to give you a couple of ideas in each area um and i'll credit adrian griffin for helping to to frame this because it's a great you know, as lead assistant for the Raptors, uh, a great way to frame, you know, the three things that an offense needs. They need time, you know, uh, they need space, and they need options, right? Um, in, in terms of your timing, you know, from the other end is how can you affect the pace of the game? You know, what are some of the things that we'll look at that you can do to affect the pace of the game? Uh, from a space perspective, pressure. And this is like one that seems so simple, um, but it can be done and it's, it could be, I think a lot of people think, well, I don't have athletes or I don't have, you know, there's a lot of reasons for not doing it, but I think ball pressure is so important and so key in terms of taking space and being disruptive. Uh, and the last one um, is options and it'll center around some denial and we'll show you uh, some options, some uh, opportunities to do that, that again, can work within uh, what you're trying to do. So we know that Again, this is stealing from uh, Jay Triano, right? We know that in the, last, in the first six seconds, those, those points are, are worth 33% more, right, than in the last six seconds. So how do you get people, you know, grind teams down and force them into turnovers or force them into those late possession shots? Um, I talked about affecting the pace of the game uh, and disrupting their flow. I like to say own the first eight, you know, and something I, I've always been really big on is own the first eight seconds. Keep teams out of transition as best as you possibly can. You'll notice in the NBA, a lot of teams just run back. They don't even offensive rebound. Although if you listen to Jay's presentation, offensive rebound can be valuable. Um, but that's just sort of what, what happens because teams are so worried about giving up that 1.2 in the first six seconds of the clock. So let's have a look at some, some, uh, some thoughts or ideas. We call this black <clears throat> uh, with the Raptors 905. And again, it's something that you know, everyone can do. So if you're a pack line team, for example, it doesn't matter. You can start full court in this way and not have to have something too dramatic as in a 2-2-1, two, 2-A, two, two, X, Y, and Z, right? This is something you can, you can do that's pretty simple. Here you'll see uh, Terrence Davis immediately denying. So this is at the beginning of the fourth quarter, and we're talking about opportunities to do this, right? There's a lot of these situations where you know, beginning of a quarter is a good example. Uh, after ATOs, after timeout situations, good example, where they're dead balls and the other team has gone back to set up for whatever their coach has just drawn up, right? They're ready to, to, to run whatever play. Well, here's a really simple, and I know you guys are going to say, wow, that's really simple, but really simple way to let this play to force people out of that, 
and to disrupt right away. So there Terrence Davis gets a denial, right? Two points in two seconds, um, just from denying the primary ball handler. Right, and if you're doing this, and I say it's a long game, but you do this over different periods at different times of the game, because obviously you're not going to pick up and play full court all game. But here are great opportunities to take advantage um, of the offense, and you can see the ball handlers looking down the floor looking for help. Right, it immediately sucks people out. I'll show you another clip here. You know, this is this is us. Where now, watch the the the, the handler out of bounds, calling everyone back, sees a little bit of pressure, right? Now people have to get out of their alignment and, and not, right, not get into their stuff. And I'll pause it just quickly. Now, instead of having Xavier Mumford, who was their primary ball handler, handle the ball, somebody else has to do it. And now they're in a little bit of a scramble, right? They ran a play, they drew up a play where Mumford was trying to get it. We added a, a denial and now they're just scrambling and they're playing. And this is the point where we start to talk about controlling factors, right? And I'll let that go back and play. What do we do? We boil them back down to a mid-ball screen or an isolation, which we feel we can guard um, nine times out of 10. So whoever's, uh, whoever's guarding the inbounder will just take away our primary ball handler, let somebody else get it, and then we maintain the denial until center court, until they get into something else. They'll abandon going to back to that person and now they're scrambling, looking for a different option. It's simple, it's easy, and now you're playing. And now you're just back to boiling down the factors. You know, it's taking them 11 seconds to sort of initiate something. Um, and you can add that into whatever it is, or however you uh, play uh, from a system standpoint. Here's one. You know, I don't have too many where the Raptors are on this end of it, but here's one that Philly does to, to the Raptors, right? So they're taking away Fred Van Vliet, right? He tries to go back, and then you, you kind of delayed. You've slowed them down, right? So now you've slowed them down. They have to readjust, and they do a really good job. You see Fred becomes a screener, and they just figure it out. But they're figuring it out at 11 seconds versus figuring it out walking up the floor, um, you know, with, with, uh, with uh, the, you know, 20 seconds, for example, right? And I think that's so important. Every second matters when you're on defense. Does replay that. Every second matters when you're on defense. The more you can take away even this, you know, crossing, at, you know, at 18 and then disrupting the first action. And now it's 13. And now they're going to continue to play because the Raptors are really good at that. Um, but are a lot of teams really good at that? You know, and that's, that's something really simple that you can do. Um, to get them down and boil them down, you know, late into a shot clock. Here's an example where, you know, the, the Suns are doing this. Oh, it's a little loud. Where the Suns are doing this to, to Bledsoe. They get the ball out of Bledsoe's hands and, and um, I believe Corver's got it now. And now they're, they're trying to figure it out, right? Milwaukee's trying to figure it out. And they get a drive from Matthews. Is that what, you know, if you're Milwaukee, is that what you want every time down the floor, right? Um, probably not, right? And you'd rather have somebody else initiate. Um, and there's different factors. I mean, in this game, Giannis isn't playing, but that's irrelevant. It's even more reason to do it and put, put the ball in guys' hands who aren't typical playmakers, right? And a very simple denial. Any, any questions so far? Uh, just a question, I guess, a little bit about ball pressure. So, you know, with the rules change a little bit in the NBA with the health defense rule and everything, how aggressive do you play on the ball or how, many, how do you change that pressure? I'm going to show you that in the space segment coming up. So let Perfect. me – yeah, I'll talk about that in one second. So. Okay. And then one more question. Yes. Uh, with, when you're running black, whose call, whose call is that denied? Is that a recognition from the guard or is that – a call from the bench? How do you get into that? Yeah, a little bit of both. I mean, a, a little bit of both. I think there's easy times where they, you know, players can do it. And I know as we sort of introduced it, you know, with, with our staff in the 905, the players, you know, slow. Sometimes that early on they kind of forgot. And then eventually, they'd be, hey, should we be in? You know, they sort of figured it out for themselves. Um, you know, let's talk about a few times that you can do it. Um, free throws, right? Perfect time. The way you would press, instead of getting into a full-out press, 
just don't exert all the energy. Have one person do it. Right. You know, have one person get up and deny the basketball and get it out of his hands instead of having to, you know, force turnovers like with a full systematic, um, you know, thing. It's just an, an alternative to that. Uh, so free throws is a good situation. Um, after timeouts is a good situation. You know, um, obviously at the beginning of any quarters is a good situation. If you can after a score. So if your offense is cooking and, you know, the ball's moved and you get a really good three or get a shot that you know is going to be taken, that goes in. Typically, you know, people are doing one thing or the other. They're crashing or they're getting back. And so you have a sense of it, you know, when the ball goes in. You know, if you're scouting and you know who's taking the ball out every time, a lot of teams – you know, have their four or their five or whoever take the ball out. So, you know, if you're going to be down there anyway, if you're an offensive rebounding team, let's say there's an easy way. If you're an offensive rebounding team, your four goes to the glass. Well, he's a, the four is inbounding as well. You know, the offensive four as the ball goes in. Now he can just quickly be, he's already there. He can already deny, even on his way back. We used to say something, um, um, man, uh, fanning out, we used to call it. When I was at Brock, we did, had this term called fanning out. So basically when the ball you know, as you're on your way back, you would do a little loop to deny the, the inbounder on your way back, just to force them back, you know, three or four feet and stop their transition. Another simple, small, um, disruptive technique so that they weren't flying at you every time you put the ball in the hoop. Yeah, that's a great change of pace, kind of keep the, the opponent off, the, off uh, feeling comfortable. So that's great. Thanks. Yeah, super subtle um, things, but can be extremely effective. So there, the denying Jamal Murray who has a monster dunk in this game, if you guys ever get a chance to watch it. Um, but they de deny Murray, and then they add a denial. So one more denial, and now, you know, and, and, and you stop it there, and now they're into denial mode, right? Just one simple denial. Don't let Murray have it. Jokic, obviously, pretty good, um, pretty good player, pretty good passer. Um, but because it's Milwaukee, this is adding to their stuff. They're in a drop and protecting the paint anyway. So... If he attacks, for them, it's not a huge deal, right? If he takes on Brooke Lopez, well, that's okay with them. Uh, and if he stays within the three, and you guys have all heard all the analytics talks, you know, if he shoots that, if it's con contested, you live with that too. So um, another uh, example there. So we get into space, and here we're going to talk about some ball pressure. Um, and, and I think when I started in the G League last year and, and watching the NBA, you know, you always wonder what's transferable. and everyone. I think a lot of people think that, you know, wow, that player's too good to be ball pressured. Oh, that, you know, you can't ball pressure him, you know, and if you're talking the W, you can't ball pressure her because they're, you know, they're too good. Um, I think all good teams, and I've seen it now, all good teams incorporate, you know, elements of ball pressure into their defense. Everybody does it who's good. Um, and so we'll look at that a little bit. And then the other piece is blitzing. And, and we'll talk about uh, the why, you know, because I think is important, you know, um, who are you blitzing? What are your sort of thoughts on blitzing, you know, as a disruptive method? Um, you know, some people go with the hot player, you know, the player that's, that's going crazy. I think, you know, you think about the Raptors and this is no secret. I'm not giving anything away here. The Raptors played uh, Houston and just blitzed the crap out of Harden. And, you know, it was pretty effective. Um, or, or are you one of those that likes to blitz the third, you know, to fifth option, you know, the person that's not used to being, uh, in those positions and making those plays, you know, uh, or do you blitz for, um, you know, to put the ball in a particular person's hands, right? Like, you know, so you blitz and a lot of times, a lot of people will leave the big open on the short roll, uh, and play out of that and force them to make decisions. So we'll look at some of those, um, as we go through. So here we are, we're adding. So now I'm just showing you a little bit of layering, right? We're adding a little pressure, right? A little bit of that, the black, they get the ball back in. There's two really good Canadian basketball players, Shayok and Brissett, a third there with Tyler Ennis. But what you can see is as he comes down, good ball pressure, right? And I'll replay it for you. Good ball pressure um, by Brissett, right? Influencing it. And what does Tyler Ennis do guarding the guy? They're trying to run a pistol action. Uh, he just jams him up and he starts putting a hand in the passing lane. So pretty good ball pressure, good length, and then passing lane pressure. They kind of abandon, right? And then back to ball pressure and we're right in them. And 
the more we kind of speed them up and force them to abandon and force them to, to, to try to be creative, the more we can start isolating factors and boil them down to what we know we can control. You know, in this case, it's a mid pick and roll or, or a lot of times it's isolation. People go into ISO mode when the clock starts winding down um, and you can sort of dictate that. You know, I think the only team that really does it more deliberately and they are also the highest isolation team and I think we can all guess is Houston, who is number one, and number one and two isolation players in the NBA are are um, are Russ and 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 Harden, and both on the same team. So, go figure. Here's a combination of of pressure, and I'm adding pressure into passing lanes. So now we're starting to add a little bit more. So Paul Watson's guarding the ball. Look at that ball pressure here. Great job. O'Shea Brissett, great ball pressure, and now we're pressuring the passing lanes and we're being extremely disruptive, right? We'll show that one again. We're being extremely disruptive and with simple ball pressure. And we have some other principles in this game and things that we were, were trying to do with certain guys, but the ball pressure doesn't change for us because we know it's disruptive, right? So does that, can you start to see some of the, the, the way they're defending? Um, and how much ball pressure does that start to answer some of your question there? Yeah, I think it does. I, I think your your first slide even talking about can you pressure everybody, you know, and what kind of pressure can you put in? So that's that helps answer that question. So here's one we're denying. We got good ball pressure. We're adding a little bit of denial to disrupt, right? And look at the clock. We're in that five, four, three, two, that one stage, and we got the right guy, you know. Uh, to take the right shot and we're going to talk about options in a minute but this is important because you know part of uh, you know I use Milwaukee again I'm using a lot of Milwaukee because I'm watching a lot of them too but um, you know they give up the most threes in the NBA and I know coach Triano talked about that as well but one of the things that coach mentioned uh, which is important is who's taking the shot they're not just letting everybody you know shoot every three can you again can you boil down and influence their options and, and who's, who ends up taking those shots. So if you watch this one again, for us, you know, they're four on the weak side, 32, or they're five in this case, is the one taking three ultimately with five seconds left. You see multiple efforts there from Tyler Ennis not letting Jordan Sabert take that three. You see him jumping and jumping with five seconds left. He's not short closing. He's going all out. I pose a question back to you, you know, with five seconds left, what's your philosophy? What are your thoughts? You know, how do you coach your teams? What do you tell them to do? Are you still short closing with five seconds left on the clock? Um, you know, or are you flying by to force them to make another decision? Maybe dribble the ball again. Now it's four. Maybe make another pass. Now it's three, two, one. And, you know, in the NBA, they talk about, you know, handing grenades, right? Like you've just given the guy a grenade. Well, with two seconds left, that's a grenade. He's got to shoot it, right? And so that's where the percentages really start to dip. And something that I think uh, everyone should think about as you're you know, incorporating these things into your offense, if you choose to. Here's Don't another stop. one. Nope. Let's go back to this here. Look at this ball pressure here by Pascal, just really getting up, using his length, moving his feet, right? Good, great ball pressure. Time's winding down, so what did you see Kyle do there? He just flies by, right? Because he flies by, and I'll re-show this clip, but like really, really good stuff. Um, you know, great ball pressure again. And he flies by because he wants his defender to do something different, right? You got five seconds, don't shoot that, good. Now you got to put it on the ground and keep playing. And then they get a contested shot back to coach's point about shot contest. But like, that's a, that's a really important thing to think about as you're, um, you know, uh, getting them to wind the clock down. You know, what are you willing to give up? And what sort, sort of uh, sense of urgency can you create amongst your team um, to defend the whole possession and really ramp it up in those last few seconds to, to get somebody to keep offensively, to keep making decisions, to keep dribbling or to make an extra pass or, you know, whatever it is. And so the other piece of, of, uh, of that pressure is blitzing is another thing. And some people, do it in different ways. And I posed the, the questions earlier and the different whys, uh, and there are, I'm sure there are more, you know, but, you know, why are you blitzing? And, and you know, sort of what, what is your thing about blitzing, you know? And then again, the rules and, and 
how you choose to rotate completely, you know, those are things that you decide based on what you like or don't like. Um, but again, a lot of people like to blitz the, the player who's really going crazy. Some people, will, some people will blitz the ball handler. Uh, if they're a primary ball handler, like Jamal Murray handling the ball here, right, gets into a drag and they blitz him, get the ball out of his hands. And then you, if you watch, because we've talked about the, uh, we've talked about Milwaukee to death already, but they're not worried about the paint and the shot contest. They'll live with that three, right? So if you see it again, once I think it's Millsap that catches the ball, you don't see anybody re overreacting, right? So again, that's just their philosophy, but they use the blitz to get it out of Murray's hand, let somebody else be a playmaker, right? But now the clock's starting to wind down. 10 seconds, they're, they're in the paint, they're looking, and they get a contested three. And, and Jokic is a, an unbelievable player, but you know, in the NBA, the numbers matter, and he's a 31% shooter and a contested shooter, they're going to live with that. But it's not quite what they would have tried to get out of that set. So you've disrupted them from just dragging and Murray getting downhill and picking you apart, which in that particular game, he was. So that was a, a, a something they used to adjust. So here's another idea of the blitz there. Find the skip. Okay, now they're back into nothing. Ball screen again. So another ball screen, another blitz. And they do a good job with three seconds left on the clock, right? If teams that, you know, a lot of teams are pretty ball screen heavy. You know, can you do that? Now, listen, are you going to blitz every single ball screen? Probably not. You know, teams adjust, but can you throw that in um, and mix it up? Because maybe they don't think you're ball screening the second one. I think... The big thing with all of this is can you be, you know, I talked about, you know, trying to get the offense to be predictable and limiting their factors. Can you do the opposite? Can you be unpredictable defensively, you know, and, and throw things that they can't quite scout or plan for, you know, because maybe they know you blitz, but they don't know when you're going to do it. Or maybe you do it three, four times a game because you're stealing possessions, right? If there's 100, can you get 15? You know, can you get 10? You know, because if the game's equal, can you, you know, can you use these possessions to tip the scale? Um, and they're hard to scout. Is the team going to spend, you know, lots of time if you're preparing for a game worried about the blitz if you only see it two, three times a game, for example, right? So there's, you know, again, depending on whether you can convert those, it could be four to, you know, whatever, 16 points, depending on what shots you're taking after you get the ball back. So really uh, important things, I think, to think about. Ooh, go back here. Show you one last blitz clip here in the mid pick and roll. Good. And look, no overreaction to David West there, right? They don't overreact. They're not, they're okay with him. So this is the last point for me. It was about the bigs and sort of like, you know, and it's not just the bigs. I think it's, it could, it could be anybody. If there's a player that you feel like, you know, you don't believe them. That's kind of how I put it. <laughs> you know, you don't believe that they're capable of making the play or, you know, you don't feel like, you know, you want to test their ability to, to, to shoot that, you know, 18, 19 footer or whatever it is, or you think you can bait them into shooting that 18, 19 footer, right? Is another way to look at it. Um, you know, that's a great way to do it. And let's just go back to this. It's a great way to do it is to not overreact when they hit that, you know, in this case, they don't hit the roller. They, they you know, sort of the yo-yo action here, but you know, when they hit this, nobody reacts and you see it, nobody really moves. They're not worried if he shoots that. Um, and so you can sort of build that into, you know, what you're doing and how you're doing it. Uh, any questions about the blitzing piece? Uh, it was, this is a question actually back to your denial. So they talked about mm -hmm. a little bit asking if you're going to look at situational denial as part of a defensive scheme. So like, for an example, denying entries on certain actions, every time you see it, you're going to deny. Is that something you guys put into the 905 or into your plan? Uh, Sometimes, you know, not sometimes is the answer, but, but I think sit, denial, not really. I mean, you know, we're more, you know, protecting the paint more often than not, I would say. So denial at times, I think it just, you know, and we showed some clips of, um, I'll go back. Actually, there'll be some in this one, but um, situational denial, I believe in, I think, you know, personnel matters. You know, I think if I was to go back, um, you know, if I'll find it right away, but if I go back to, the clips with uh, O'Shea, there's a, 
an early one where he is denying he is denying it's okay it doesn't really matter but i can describe it he is denying the the wing so you see i, I kind of stopped it where you know tyler ennis is guarding the ball and putting pressure on it um and he's denying the wing because he was denying mariel shayok who for us you know was a guy we didn't really want to touch the ball because he could really score you know the guys know mario canadian from ottawa he can really, really score the basketball. So keeping the ball out of his hands was a, was a priority for us. Um, and so, yeah, I think there's, there's many times where you want to, you know, use denial situationally. And I think that helps add to the randomness of it, right? I think when you can um, do it for Mariel, you know, on certain actions or when he comes off certain things, you know, and, and be specific about those things with your team, it's hard for teams to adjust to that because they don't, it's not the regular dose of icing the side ball screen, you know, where they just, they start to figure it out. Okay, I'll snake it. Okay, I'll flip the screen or okay, I'll, you know, they just start to figure it out because they see it in such high doses. When you deny, you know, 10 times the inbounder um, or the, the, the primary ball handler, um, you know, they, they don't become accustomed to it because the majority of those possessions, you know, on a miss, they're not getting to denial. So they're not thinking deny all the time. You make a shot, sometimes you will just get back. So they're not thinking deny all the time. And what you find is sometimes because teams just take it in like the one clip, you know, the first clip I showed with, uh, with Terrence Davis, you know, lots of teams sort of deny or put a little bit of pressure and stand behind the inbound, you know, the ball handler, but they just throw it in. And so not a lot of teams actually go out and deny that and get that turnover because they're not denying it. They're just kind of putting a little bit of pressure that's phantom pressure on it. And then they back off and sort of guard the action. I am so sort of uh, um, not against, but I, I just have a hard time with the idea of, okay, we know what they're going to run. And I know uh, Gemma will laugh because I was like, we always know, we know what they're going to do. Why do we just let them do it all the time? Now you can't stop it every time, but can you be disruptive more often than not? As opposed to, you know, we know you guys all scout. So, you know, the play's coming. You, you, half the time you're yelling it out. You know, I used to play teams and, and they'd be yelling your play for you. And it's like, okay, well, great. You're right. So now stop it. <laughs> you know, if you know it so well, let's figure that out. And so, um, you know, I think that's the, the other part of it. So, yeah, I mean, again, back to answer the question is I think you got to be as disruptive and as, um, you know, deliberate, but uh, I guess what's the term? Um, unpredictable as possible for when you know you, you choose to use those things. We have one more uh, blitz question here too, if you don't mind. Sure. So, uh, would you blitz against the pick and pop threat if the big can shoot a three percent, the three pointer at a high percentage? You can. Some people are afraid of that. You can. You may you maybe rotate the weak side over. You know, if he's a really good shooter, then maybe you just switch it. Um, but if he's a pick and pop, I mean, you can. You can. Hey, listen. I'll give you some factors. Is your who are you blitzing with? Who are you blitzing, right? Because are you, do you believe that, again, do you believe the guy? Do you believe that this person can find that pot? Yeah, we know it's open. You're going to leave something open when you're doing that. Um, you know, but there are some times where you say to yourself, man, we're, we're okay with that. You know, if the person's a 45% three-point shooter, you're probably not going to do that. But, you know, there might be times where you might be okay with a guy who shoots, I don't know, 30% from three. And he's popping and he's taking a lot of them or 20, you know, whatever, whatever the numbers are. So it is situational. It's not like a blanket. Would you pop, you know, but it, it totally depends. And obviously, you know, all of us coaches, we do our homework in terms of getting to know who's in the action because that does matter. Um, and what are they, what are their tendencies? What are they likely to do? Right. They blitzed um, in the last clip that Murray and Jokic pick and roll, they blitzed it and, and Jokic caught it and nobody batted an eye really. Right. Um, so it just, again, it depends on uh, personnel, not to give you a sort of a flaky answer, but um, who's in the screens definitely matters. No, those are good things to consider. Okay, I'll give it back to you. Uh, so a couple of things. So the, the last one was the options, right? The last thing that people need are their options to score. So again, we're talking about limiting the options so that we can control sort of what we have to ultimately defend. Um, and so we'll just show a couple of things here. Um, that we can talk to one is what we call lockdown, what I call lockdown and the other ones, you know, the top lock that you see in the NBA. Uh, so here's one. So lockdown, the idea of the lockdown is this. It's if, again, talk about believing players, but if you have a player who's not comfortable, who's not typically in situations 
like in this case, it's going to be Miles Leonard to make plays, right? Miles Leonard is not a one-on-one -on -one basketball player in this con in the NBA context. Good basketball player, um, you know, is obviously a, a really high-level player, but he's not a one-on-one -on -one James Harden style player. So for us, when he touches the ball, or in this case, you know, the Celtics do it to him. I'll let it play. When he touches the ball, it's, it's one. Right there he is. He touches the ball, and now everyone gets denied. You see Kemba Walker take away Hero, you know, a little bit of pressure on Butler, right? And you're forcing him now to make plays because guess what? It's a race against the clock, right? On, on our end, every second matters. So, you know, on the defensive end, I say our end, but on the defensive end, every second matters. So you see it again. Butler brings it up, right? We don't want Hero to touch it. Kemba denies access to the screen there, right? And then it's one-on-one. -on -one. And we're going to take, you see how Butler tried to cut, Hayward cuts it off um, because they don't want anyone else touching it. Let him figure that out. They trust that matchup, um, that Miles Leonard matchup, and that's what they go with. And here's, again, another example of that where the big gets it. Uh, some people call it big above, right? They get it up there, and you're forcing him to make plays. He sees the clock, too. They know, right? All these guys know, but we've limited their options, and we've brought them down to the isolation. And now we're taking it even further, and we're saying, not only are we boiling it down to an isolation, but we're boiling it down to who gets to isolate us, right? So we're not saying we want Harden to isolate us all game because that could be really bad news, but we're saying who now gets to isolate us. So locking people down or cutting people off, and it doesn't always have to be bigs or pick on bigs, but it could be players who are not necessarily one-on-one -on -one players. But now who gets to isolate, um, again, becomes important because you don't want Butler isolating or hero coming off and shooting a three like he's trying to come back off that screen right so now they have a little again a little pressure in the lane and off you go there's another one we put a little bit of pressure full court right primary ball handler Mumford gives it up we deny access and now we've got to get Clifford to make a play like I think I begged Jamma to to do this all game against these guys so not that he's a bad player it's just that we want him in a position um, to make plays because he's not used to it it's not typical when you watch them play that's not what they do all the time right so now we're cutting off access to just a simple handoff and allowing Mumford to make a play we're forcing their big to make a play um, which leads to a turnover Here's one somebody talked about uh, Making it. when it happens. This is, I think this is out of bounds. So here, they're going to deny Booker, who's kind of at the bottom of the screen here. They're going to deny Booker, right? Take that away from him. Don't let him touch it, right? Fight through that. Don't let him have it. We all know how good Devin Booker is. And then live with, with, the, the, with that three from Aaron, right? Like, that's what you want. You want to live – well, that's what they want. But I think that's the idea is – you know, you're not going to let the prior, you're not going to let Booker isolate because he's really good at that, right? So we're going to let, you know, um, Aaron here isolate because he, that may not be what his strength is, right? So we, we try to limit the factors um, by sort of being what we call lockdown with certain guys, right? So take, take away Booker, you know, they go to the pick and pop here. Who, and he can't shoot the three, but a contested three is very different than a wide open three if you're a pick and pop guy. couple more here uh oh we'll get into top locks uh and that'll be the last sort of piece here so a top lock is uh and we'll, we'll show it and then we'll talk more about it but you basically deny access to an off ball screen right so um you know in this case can be divincenzo i think i spelled his name wrong but that's okay um you know we're, we're going to um deny access to an off ball screen by getting in between the screener and our man So you'll see the pin downs about to happen at the top of the screen. And we'll let it play once and you'll see it. So he denied access to Booker and then they get into that mid range jump shot and, and yeah, he fouled, which is a terrible foul, but in the course of the game and you guys again have all heard the analytics, you want that contested mid range jump shot. If you're, you know, and especially if you're the Bucks, who's a paint protection team, that's, that's ex essentially what you want. You know, I think for, for any team, regardless of what your thing is, you know, uh, that's a tough shot to make. 
I'll just go back a little bit and isolate it right now. So as the pin down starts to come, you can see perfect. Can is that stop right on the point? I don't know if I'm delayed. No, you're you good there. Okay, perfect. So you can see Divincenzo's right at that point. He sits right on top um, and denies Booker access, you know, to what could be an easy three or a curl or something that could be detrimental for a player of his caliber, right? To your defense. What's really important though. Uh, is building in your backside. And when you're going to top lock somebody, um, you got to have, I mean, you're inviting the back cut, right? You're inviting him to the rim is what you're doing. You're funneling them back to the rim. Um, and in this case, you know, for, for the Bucks, they have Brooke Lopez, but whoever you are, when you do that, you, you have to make sure, um, you know, your backside is built in or obviously that's a dunk or a layup. I mean, that's, that's a no brainer, but, but this is a, an example of something that's, that's disruptive. So if you watch now, you'll see, Booker's path, right, to try to get the ball and a little bit of denial pressure. And now you force somebody else to take a jumper. And again, it's not like other guys aren't good. It's just that can we put them in those situations where we know Booker is going to be taking the, the abundance of the shots, especially in crunch time. You know, can you influence who's starting to take some of those shots? And here's another one. Um, Left shoulder jumper. Here's another one from the Clippers, right? You see Kawhi get into that spot. Now he's got Ingles on, on the baseline and pretty good defense. And we'll go back to it. I think, you know, the top, top lock is a tool like everything else. It's one of the menu items that, you know, that I think, you know, we can use. So, oops, sorry. So there it is. He's starting, he sees it. He sees the pin down coming, right? Kawhi at the top of the screen there sees the pin down coming starts to sit over top, you know, and, and obviously they know they're inviting the back cut, but they have rim protection, the big sags off, um, and they deny access. They don't want Ingles coming off, shooting the three, curling it, getting into the paint, creating other uh, pieces of havoc for their defense. So they just blow it up and don't let it happen. Right? So then the ball goes into the corner, and I would suggest that, you know, you don't want – be locked in a corner with with Kawhi Leonard, you know, defensively. Like it's a pretty good matchup, I think, for for the uh, for the Clippers in that situation. Um, I'll show these two. I wasn't going to, but I will anyway. Uh, but I, I'll show these two, and then we'll take questions. Um, and I think I'm showing these because really they got questions, and I think sort of around your late clock um, rules or principles or whatever and I think you know something to think about do you have them right so here's a, a full clip of some denial we don't want primary guy to have it we have ball pressure we got denials you know it's kind of everything in one here right we got the matchups we want we got the handlers we want we got late clock isolation one-on-one -on -one, you know into a step back shot we we can dictate that and I think your defense can dictate you know for the most part what you're going to get and who's going to who it's going to come from Right, so we, we don't let we let Haywood Highsmith, who everyone knows I'm a big fan of, but in this situation he's not used to bringing it up, so we can get good pressure here, right? And now we've isolated our factors in in our ball screen coverages, right? And now the clock's winding down, and we're good, right? So I'm just I'm going to show one more thing with that with that clip because it's quite a bit in that clip. But on the other end, at the bottom, number five for them is 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 Mumford. And you see our guy kind of in the lane, right? He's taking that, he's in the passing lane, taking that, uh, not only the drive away, but the passing away to help, you know, our, our Matt Morgan there keep isolated, right? One-on-one. -on -one. And that's a pretty good matchup for us, uh, we think. And there you go. And again, we didn't script it that way, but that's what ends up happening when you put that kind of pressure um, on people. So what's your late clock rule is something to think about uh, as we go through. So in conclusion, you know, there are so many other factors. Obviously, if you're going to be a good defensive team, you got to communicate, you know, you got to have great effort. I always say who can win the discipline battle, right? Because, you know, the, one of the number one things that people want to do, knowing what we know offensively, um, is you want to get to the free throw line. So who can be disciplined enough to, to not foul and to put pressure on teams and to, you know, twist them and turn them and force them into, you know, things that they don't want to do necessarily. Um, I think that discipline battle is so important. Um, and then again, the question of how can you influence options, you know, the offense to make them make their uh, actions more predictable. Can you narrow down and sort of, you know, whittle them down so you know what you have to guard, uh, whether it's isolation or 
you know, typically pick and roll. And obviously there's other things and really good teams are really patient with, you know, six seconds is, doesn't scatter them. But you find even in the NBA, as I watch, some teams feel that pressure and they want to get that shot off. So um, anyway, those are the, the three things in summary, time, space, and options. And um, that's it. Questions. Yeah, so question on, and that was some great stuff in there, I think, applicable for everybody. And I, the one question was late in the clock, when you're going one-on-one against a good penetrator, do you bring help over early? Like, will you sort of, you know, shrink the floor late because you know where, where you are on the clock? So late clock. So, yeah, I mean, I think that's important because, again, what do you want them to do? So if you know late clock they're going to drive, yeah, you're probably going to load up. Why? Because it's going to force an extra pass with the clock winding down, right? Every second matters, as I've said. So um, a lot of times, yeah, as the clock winds down, you might shrink it. And you saw in the one clip, Tyler Ennis, multiple efforts to, 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 you know, to deter a guy from even shooting the ball, right? Force him to make another decision with the basketball with five, three, four, five seconds left. Um, and, and, and sort of narrow down, again, the factors. Try to get them into ISOs with the matchups that you want. A uh, question here about what are some of the, the stats or analytics that you guys look at in-game for, for these types of things? What are, what are you looking at or, or what are you tracking uh, to see what you're, how you're disrupting? Is it, that's a tricky one for us, personally, because it's not like, um, you know, it's one of those things you know whether you're getting stopped. I mean, we stop. We track our stops and, you know, stuff like that. Um, it's, it depends, you know, I would say one of the best things to do is if you're going to use black, for example, you know, you, you, you track that and you track the outcomes, you know, and the outcomes could be, did we get, and, and you can determine it. And that's the beauty of this. Like, Hey, we're going to use black to get the ball out of X player's hands and force somebody else to run it. Okay. Well, what do we accomplish by doing that? Do we get them to not run anything now because they've been trying so hard to run that ATO? Did we get them to isolate and maybe play one-on-one -on -one with somebody else, you know, that we, that we want in isolation? Like, what are those things? And, and I'd say you track those things. I mean, we don't necessarily track those things specifically, but those things are things you can track, um, you know, sort of as you're going through and, and applying these things to, to, to assess their value. And I think, you know, ultimately what you're trying to do is disrupt. You're trying to not let them run what they wanted to run. You're trying to send that pass closer to center court as, as opposed to in the paint, you know, you're trying to do all those little things that, that force them to constantly recalibrate their offense and do, you know, um, and, and sort of get back to square one over and over while the clock ticks down. So last one on your, uh, your action, you showed the lock uh, coming off the pin screen. What are some things that teams do to counter that? Like, how do they, how do they go against that? The top lock? Well, yeah, top, one, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a good one. So one, obviously the back door, you know, yeah. I think, you know, and I, and I put that note in there. It's like, you know, if you're, if your big is too high and you can't get to the rim, it's lob city, you're getting a dunk. Right. Um, so the top lock is one. The other one is, is to, is to rescreen. So um, if you have a double stagger, for example, you maybe just cut out the first guy and then send the second guy, or maybe, you know, your, 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 your if you're double staggering, your second screener is the one you actually want, you know, to come off. So you can curl the first screen, right? Uh, and your second screener is a guy you want coming off. So our first screener might curl the first one and take the top lock guy with them, you know, take that defender with them as, as our, you know, primary guy or a second screener comes off the second um, screen, right? Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, no, and that's, that's great. I think that's a, a neat concept to see for sure. So, so, Coach, again, uh, we're going to wrap up here. I really appreciate your time for your session and then all the work you put into this session. Some really great stuff there. We really appreciate it. Everybody, wanted, uh, we want to thank you from Basketball Immersion and Golden Ticket Sports. But we're going to give you the last word and, and let you wrap up for today. Uh, I just want to say thanks. I think this is unbelievable. Again, thanks, Chris, and all of you over there, you guys moderating. I really think um, – this is important that we're sharing. I think for so long we didn't do this in this country. And I think it's, you know, Jay Trano said it. People have been saying it for years. I know Jama says that we have some great coaches in this country. And, and I think we got to continue to highlight. I think we got to continue to share. I think like Sandy did for me, like Jama's done for me, like we have to continue to, uh, to give people opportunities to, to, to grow. And I think that's the way we'll continue to have our players, you know, reach heights and our coaches reach heights. So uh, I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Yeah, awesome. Thanks again. Some really great feedback for you in the in the chat and 
in the questions here. So thanks again for your time. And thanks to all the coaches that tuned in. Stay tuned. We have another session coming up. And thanks again.